and do an official start here. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Von Rieden, better known as Von Art Online, and I do these weekly Wednesday live streams every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time. They usually focus on something related to art, the life of an artist, or just general fun conversation. Today, I'm going to work on extending our collector creature that we started a while back. And the idea, initial idea, prompt was a creature made entirely of arms. Why, thank you, Mr. Fister21542, for following. And this is where we are so far. And the, the story behind this creature kind of became a collaboration between myself and you guys, and it got me so excited on that stream. So I'll give a quick synopsis. Essentially, this creature is made entirely of arms. And when you come to visit the creature, he's holding this massive key ring that has thousands of rings on it, maybe like a hundred. <laughs> and it's up to you to decide which ring fits the keyholes that are literally on every single hand. And if you're able to pick the right key to the keyhole, you unlock all the treasures that that hand stole in its life. And we were kind of debating between whether or not that meant something actual physical or something more mental, like do you unlock potential or do you just lock tr like physical treasure? Still left to be decided, but essentially you would then unlock it and be able to keep it for yourself. But if you picked a key and it was the wrong keyhole, then the creature gets to take one of your arms and adds it to his ever-growing collection. So that is the story so far with our creature. We've had a lot of cool side notes that I have actually written here because I think there's a lot of other interpretations we could go. And I'm not like fully set on that story being the only story. So I'm open to interpretation. And if there's something that we think is better suited for the story, I'm definitely willing to change it. I want this to be more of an evolving um, piece. And I want it to be edge to edge filled and just filled with all these arms and hands. So I'm going to work primarily in this bottom left corner here and really work in, on trying to render some of these arms for the stream today. And the reason I'm working left is because if you, a lot of you work in graphite, you know that sometimes graphite can rub and smudge on the paper. But if you work left to right, you can kind of avoid that whole scenario. So I've tried to be more effective and efficient with my drawing process. I try not to keep it too methodical because I think when it's too methodical, it ends up being too tight and a lot of the creativity gets washed away because of that because you're not allowing the piece to grow as your piece is growing. Why thank you, Heyang, for following. So I'm gonna focus on a lot of these hands. I took some reference photos on my phone before we got started. And when I was a teacher, I always said, use yourself as a reference. So here's my awkward, embarrassing photos of myself but they're going to be used as my reference today. Oh, I wish the iPhone you could flip the image. I don't know why they don't have that yet. I guess I'll work with the one image that is the right way. Okay, I'm going to actually take this off. Ugh. Okay, so I guess my quick note on what tools I'm using, in case any of you are curious on working more traditionally. I work with these general Kimberly pencils, and I usually start my drawings down with a 2H, and if you don't know, the, the numbers and letters represent the hardness scale, H being the lightest, so like a 9H, and then 9B would be the darkest, and then your middle point would be HB. So I start with a lighter pencil being 2H, because like anything above a 4H is like incredibly light. So then I'll do a 2B for most of the shading and general rendering of the piece. And then when I'm ready to punch out the values, let's see if I have it on me, I'll either use a 9B, an 8B, or a 6B. And 9B will be really, really dark. So I have to be careful where I use that. And then in terms of my erasers, I use a mono eraser. This is meant for getting in those tight little bugger areas that you want to erase. And then a kneaded eraser, which is somewhere around here. Ah, here we go. Which is like your little gummy looking uh, eraser that is used to kind of blot areas if necessary. And you can form it into different shapes so it's easier to get around with. 
And I think that's mostly it. I use a two point cum uh, pencil sharpener. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. It might be cum, but I think it's cum. And essentially the first hole strips the wood, second hole strips the graphite. So this is what you would want if you want like a really sharp point. And since I don't actually want a really sharp point starting off these hands, I'm gonna keep it kind of dull. And basically it's to prevent rendering too soon. Like I don't wanna go into a drawing in detail too early because then I'm not being effective with my time. And since I'm learning that my time has become increasingly more uh, valuable and seemingly escaping me, I wanna make sure I'm making the most of it. Okay, so since I already used the 2H to kinda of get the general pose of all the hands, I'm going to now start rendering. And if you guys have any questions or uh, comments that you want to ask during the stream, just put at Von Art and I'll be sure to look up and down to make sure that I am uh, seeing them and answering them to the best of my ability. And sorry that I am looking disheveled. I am just all over the place and I'm just excited for the stream. Okay, let's get into it. So I already kind of rendered these hands here a bit. I wanted there to be really dark contrast for this figure that's supposed to be more ominous, or not ominous, more vague, I guess. And I want it to be more of a bright light. So to have it be more of a vocal point, you have everything else around it more dark. It's the idea of contrast. And if you're a grayscale artist like myself, you'll know that that is going to be your biggest player in redirecting the viewer's eye to the areas that you want them to go. And naturally, our human eyes love contrast. So you want to play with that and not in like a deceptive way, but you wanna play with the idea of pushing the viewer's eye where you want it to be. And then if they take the extra time to look around your piece, it's like they find these little Easter eggs that they may not have noticed at first glance, which is great. So let's see here. I'm gonna start working on this hand. And let me see if my reference is a good one. Not really, but I'm gonna work with it. I would almost always recommend when drawing hands to take reference photos and use them pretty diligently. But since I want some looseness and some kind of different looking arms and areas, I'm gonna wing it a little bit. I'm sure that sounds like blasphemous considering I'm a teacher and I'm not like following my own rules, but I want to have fun with it. And I mean, if the hands look really bad, I can just go ahead and erase it and then redo it. I think that's the beauty of being not a very heavy-handed artist. I draw very light and I build up my values slowly. And a lot of people would criticize this for not being the right way and that you should be more confident with your strokes and blah, blah, blah. And in a way, I actually do agree with them. I think this does show sometimes a lack of confidence. But in my defense, I think it's also, this allows me to explore more because it's not so set in stone, it almost allows my drawing to grow and adapt to fit essentially the mood of the piece or the mood of wherever I want to have contrast or without. Because like I said, that's the one thing I play with the most in my pencil drawings. And you'll see me as I'm like rendering these hands purposely make decisions that adds contrast, even if it's not the most realistic. So I guess, let me answer some questions while I'm doing this first part. Um, hey, Maria, says so just popping in for a sec, say hi. Hey, how are you doing? Jiren says, can you tell us more about DragonCon? I definitely can. So this was my favorite, my second favorite show of the year, I'm sorry, because Gen Con killed it. Even though I made more money at DragonCon, I just loved the atmosphere of Gen Con and the people that were there. And... Money should never be like the number one factor deciding on what is your favorite show of the year if you do a lot of cons. For me, it's how is the experience. So I don't want to knock it though because I would definitely say this was my second favorite experience of the year. So how was it? It was a combination of like Gen Con and Spectrum, but also like a really big comic show. Like that's kind of my best way of describing it. But it was phenomenal in the essence that 
the people that were there were like ones that we either just saw at Gen Con or ones that I haven't seen for a little bit. And it was like a reunion. I, I'm going to bring that up a lot when I go to these kind of bigger, more prestigious art shows because you start to learn that the people that go to these or the people that show at these shows are kind of the same almost every time. And yeah, you get some newcomers, but a lot of them are these like very masterfully trained artists that, I mean, I've been looking up to for a while. And even my roommates, like we all have been looking up to these great artists for such a long time. And to be not only recognized by them, but to be like actually hanging out with them and, you know, just talk as friends rather than it being like mentor and peer, it's it's nuts. And even every time I talk to Alan, though, I still get a little nervous, but he always treats me like an equal. And it it boggles my mind sometimes that like I get to not only meet my hero, but I respect him. And they always say like, don't meet your heroes. But I feel like I was one of the lucky that has a hero that not only is amazing at his craft, but is an amazing person too. So in that aspect, it's amazing. I did have a little bit of a problem because the books that I reordered came in botched. I won't go too much on it because I feel like that's just dreading on the negatives of what happened. But essentially, I didn't have my books for the show. And like day one, I was like, ah, that means I'm not going to make as much. And it was kind of getting me down. But then literally my first sale was an original sale. And I was like, you know what? Rather than letting this whole book thing bother me all weekend, I'm going to move past it and try to enjoy this to the best of my ability as if the book situation wasn't even a thing. So anyways, besides that, it was great seeing like the Gerards again. If you guys don't know Justin and Annie Stag Gerard, they are this married couple that does phenomenal work. Like, I would say setting a standard for the new generation to come. And what's crazy is I've met them a few times now, and they are just so funny and, <laughs> and like, laid back. You wouldn't even think, like, they're these amazing artists that have influenced so many because they're just so casual about everything. But they are not casual about the way that they dress up their booth in the way that they uh, do their craft. It is excellent. And every time I see their work in person, especially Annie's oils, it just it's mind-numbing a bit to see how this medium can really sing in person. Because oil, if a lot of you guys know, is harder to capture. Like in a photograph, you don't really get the same experience as seeing it in person. Uh, this one I'll definitely need reference for. I do not like the way that that's looking here. What is this weird wart of a bump? So like I said, I'm trying my best not to over detail right now. Because I really want to get in there and render. And I will render for you guys near like the last half hour. I'll pull up if not a sharpened 2B, even maybe my point two mechanical pencil to get those details in there. I definitely want to play with the knuckles. Because when you have so many hands like this, it's just like a cluster. And it can get very disorganized very quickly. So I want to make sure that I'm not focusing too much on the prominent details right now. But instead, I'm focusing on the values and the contrast that they create around them. Because that way, when I go into detail, I'll know that the values are all set. And if you guys are traditional painters or if you do landscapes, or like, I mean, guess general and Art, in a sense, is like you really should focus on values and the composition first and then worry about the details. Too often we're focusing on the details first. And I can tell you firsthand, I am a culprit of that, let me tell you. And you got to just almost take a step back sometimes and make sure everything reads the way that you're wanting it to.
Um, Sean says, but I got to go run errands before the show. I'll see you guys around. Bye, Sean. Have fun. Uh, Jim says, have you been to LuxCon? And was it like, I have not, but it's similar to Spectrum. Apparently in the caliber of art, it's really high, but not yet. I hopefully will next year, but I don't know yet. Because it's in October, and October is like my favorite month of the year. And I try to spend a lot of it focused on uh, Drawtober, since I'm helping run it. And I feel like I definitely should spend some good time actually uh, being a part of it and making sure that it, it's, you know, organized. Because <laughs> otherwise, it looks really bad on my part, and I don't want to be that person that doesn't do a good job hosting their own challenge, you know. That's here. I'm looking at my reference pictures, trying to get a good one. They're all reversed, though. Hold on. I'm going to take a quick reference photo. I need it to be facing the other direction. So I don't know if you guys know this, but with iPhones, I have to take them in reverse. So that way, when it appears on the camera, it's actually mirrored the other way. I don't know why it's set up like that. I think that's very strange. Yeah, much better. See, so you can get those nice hands in there with all the tendons. Exactly what I'm looking for. And sometimes, this is a good case where, like, this original hand that I have back here, it's not looking that great, so I'll just take a kneaded eraser. I think having a drawing like this where you're not committed necessarily to anything, it's really easy to take something out or... I'll move it around because it doesn't affect you or the whole composition as a whole and you can be a little more picky with where things are going. Let's see here. I'm going to do... I'm going to try to do both these arms here. While I'm doing that, let me find more questions here. Girl Sean says, botch books. I'm sorry. And Alan Pinnacle had $700 of his work stolen from a suitcase on a flight back. Oh, that's terrible. Y'all yeah, have to show you the books uh, next week. It was pretty bad. Uh, CC the artist says, question. I'm trying to get really more proficient at digital painting as I am more of a traditional artist, but I wonder whether I should learn grayscale painting first before trying color. What would you suggest and what would you start with when trying to learn digital media? Okay, so ironically, even though I pretty much primarily do traditional now only, really, um, I was a digital arts teacher for CG Cookie for six years, actually. So I'm definitely um, familiar with the digital art and the process. Um, in terms of like learning grayscale first or color, I was one of those stubborn kids that I learned color first. And I didn't want to learn grayscale. I saw everyone else do it, but I was so stubborn of wanting to do color. So I learned a lot of how to paint in color primarily first. And as much as I think it kind of worked in the end, I definitely say I learned so much from exploring grayscale painting. And it's something that I would actually recommend for any artist, not even just digital painting, to also... Um, try out because you learn so much about values and the placement of them and how that affects composition and a lot of my traditional drawings actually are primarily based on the composition of uh, contrast in my values so I'm using that now almost every time I draw and I think with painting you should do it early on now, that's not to say you have to, because like I said, I learned with color, and I was stubborn, and I never really did it. But I feel like in terms of just learning how contrast can work, not only on a color level, because it's really obvious if you put yellow next to a, a teal or cyan, they're going to be very contradicting and complement each other, because they're opposite. But then uh, it's good to know 
that there are contrasts not only with value and hue, but also saturation. Too often, digital artists, especially digital artists, they oversaturate everything, and they're only playing with contrast of value, not really even contrast of color, really, and it'll just be like this really in-your-face red next to an in-your-face blue, and they're not comprehending that you need both an understanding of hue and value uh, contrast, but also of uh, saturation. So when you take that out of it and you focus, actually when you take color and, or hue and saturation out of the mix and you only focus on mastering value, all of a sudden your skills on understanding value contrast increase greatly. So when that is able to increase a lot, all of a sudden when you switch back to using color and saturation again, your knowledge will carry you into creating better pieces because then you understand the values behind them. So I'm not going to tell you what is the best way or how I think, you know, there's only one way to go about it because there's not. Everyone's journey is going to be different. And I would say as long as you're exploring and trying some new things along with mastering what you seem to be very proficient with, I think that's the best way to go about it because then you're learning new things, but you're not just throwing away what you kind of have learned has worked well for you. And that's not to say that you should never try new things either because I think that's a problem in um, prohibiting growth. But in terms of where you're at currently and how to take it to the next step, uh, experimenting and trying new things is what's going to be what will help you there. Let me focus on getting some of these tendons here. Because I do want to do more arms like interlacing with one another. I think that'd be kind of fun. Because even down here, I'll probably put more arms in front. So I'm not going to really render too far down. I swear, I have like the hiccups or something, but they're not like fully out. So every 10 seconds, I feel like one come up. I'm like, uh, uh, uh. So I think the detailing work on these hands are what really can make me feel proud of doing a a creature made entirely of arms. Because so I want every arm to feel not entirely unique, I guess, but very well observed, I guess is the best way to put it. Oh yeah, let me get more questions while I'm doing this. Uh, Haley Morrice says, I'm glad you were able to see the positives after the botched books. I had some holographic prints that turned out super devastated, and I'm trying to not let it get me down for my first ever convention tomorrow. Can't wait to see Cat at Fan X. Oh, that's right. It's called Fan X now. Yeah, uh, I'm glad. Oh, I'm sorry that I can't be there to meet you, but I'm glad that you're staying positive about the whole scenario. People can read your mood behind your booth. If you are in a negative place, people will read it and they won't want to buy from you. So I'm telling you now, when something bad happens to you, just see it as a learning opportunity in not only patience, but in putting on your best game face because you need to represent for your art and you don't want to represent for this negative thing that happened instead. And if you do, it'll be written all over your face. It'll be really hard to kind of come back from that if you let it affect you. And I feel like I got lucky having an original sale to like pull me back in. So I'm telling you now is like your own little helper, hopefully, that you cannot let things like that affect you because it will read. There we go. Uh, hey, Lady Coyote says, um, when coming out to October 28, please on comment because I'm deaf. Uh, I will put it here.
but it should be coming out this Friday or Saturday. Uh, me or Key are working on it now. It's like literally tonight we're finishing the calendar. We've had the prompts for months now because we wanted prompts that felt would be inspiring for other artists to want to do, not just some like silly, dumb, like, oh, day two, vampire, day three, witch. Like we're trying to do something a little more hopefully invigorating in that when you see the prompt, you're like, oh, that's, that really gets my creative juices flowing. And um, hopefully we'll get some good results this year. We got so many good results last year. I'm like, I don't know how we can top it, but never say never, as Justin Bieber would say. Okay, right. so yeah, I think I'm going to focus on these four arms for the next, let's see here, like 20 minutes. Then I'll move on. So I'm going to lay down the values on these two further back ones, and then I'll go in with my smaller pencil and render them out. So I definitely want there to be like a nice little gradient. I'm still not 100% sure how I want this to look. I do like right now how the fingers are holding up this kind of platform. Let me, I'm going to try a few things before I just commit to one. So bear with me as I lay out some values really lightly, and I might have to erase it. Unless if I really like it, then I'll go ahead and leave it. Let's see here. Hey, Arya says, that what's... Or why did I... Yeah, Ari says... No, that's not the right one. Yeah, it is. Oh, I, I misspelled it on here. It says Eric's. Eric says, What's the weirdest reaction or interpretation of your art that you've ever experienced? Ooh, the worst one, I will say, is someone called me a Satanist. Because I draw things with horns and they're creepy. So that was probably the worst reaction. Um, strangest was someone was like constantly using, dropping the F-bomb at me. They were like, F you, like this booth, this art's too good. F all of this. And like he kept screaming it. And me and my assistant Kat were just behind my booth like nodding like, hi. <laughs> like what are you doing right now? Um, that was the weirdest. But in terms of, like, my art interpretations, uh, I would have to say it's my battered bun drawing. Actually, I don't even have any on me right now because they're all packed away for the convention. Oh, wait, I do. You can see here. So here's one of my large prints that apparently I forgot to pack for her at the convention. But essentially, people have been seeing this in so many different ways. Some people see it as a race thing with one boy being black and one being white and the way that they are in agreement with each other about things, but the way they handle it, boy with the bat, aggressor, and then black boy with the white flag, more passive peace. And then someone interpreted this as um, children that were abused and they're the only ones that can fight for themselves and that's why they're holding hands. Other people just see it as um, which was more my interpretation of the contrast in every way. So since I love playing with contrast with value, I literally did whatever is uh, a light value on one side would be a dark value on the other. And then more metaphorically of having a baseball bat and a white flag. So that was more or less, um, or these are more or less the cooler interpretations I get when they're very open-ended and they're, it seems to be very open to interpretation. And since those are my favorite types of movies, it's no surprise that that's my favorite way that people see my art, where it's very different than its original intention. Where is my pencil? Here it is. Uh, Mate Magic says, I can't mirror my pictures on my Samsung, so I downloaded Photoshop Express to have more options. Oh, I definitely need to do that. I didn't know there was an app for that, so thank you for letting me know that. 
Uh, Girl Sean says, I wish you were coming to LuxCon this year. I probably won't be able to go next year because we're going to have another baby in the spring. <gasps> Congratulations, Girl Sean. Oh, that's really exciting. I mean, that's definitely a lot more work, but I believe in you. <laughs> Um, Papadora Zeus says, do you have any good suggestions for meat substitutes for someone trying to go vegetarian? Um, it depends on which meat. I would say some have really good substitutions. Others, not so much. So like eggs, I wouldn't try to find a replacement yet. I feel like there's a lot of bad ones trying to make it sound like they're good replacements, but they're really not. I mean, the egg replacer for like baking has been great, but in terms of just eating, I... Ugh. I cannot recommend the fake eggs. But in terms of meat, anything that's like beyond the packaging, so if it has beyond meatless burger or whatever, it's kind of a brand that seems to work very well. And uh, what was the other one? Some people like Gardein and Simply, I think they're called Simply Good or something. Um, but when it comes to fake meat, sometimes it's more like processed not actually food garbage that you don't want in your body anyways. So as much as they're trying to do good with make like these fake substitutes, I feel like your body doesn't want them either. <laughs> so I would say try to find things that are like a healthy alternative. So one thing could be instead of um, like pasta sauce with meat for spaghetti, maybe try like Pasta with avocado sauce, which is amazing, but not a lot of people know about it. Or replace the meat chunks with like tomato or onion or something that you can um, place in there. I just recommend trying to eat as many um, things that you would clearly define as actually food as possible. So if you look at a product, like if you looked at Starburst, you'd be like, you know, I don't think this is actually food. You're probably right. <laughs> if there's more chemicals on the back than food listings, that's when you know, okay, I don't think I should want to eat this. But honestly, I remember the toughest thing to give up was eggs. Because I tried to have an egg every morning. It was like my protein. And yeah, that one was a little tougher. Everything else was a little easier for me to give up. But if you really want to try um, substituting Really make sure you do the research beforehand. That's why not, I'm not like a big advocate for everyone to go vegan or blah, blah, because uh, I think it can be very unhealthy. I remember I went vegan and I was, was passing out because I didn't know what to eat, so I just didn't really eat. So I want to make sure that I'm educating people if they want to try this. Make sure you do some research first. Make sure that you're getting the proper vitamins that you would need because oftentimes things like B12 – you just get the bottle of pills and you just take one a day. And then same with other ones like vitamin D. You just got, or like iron or um, calcium, like things that are protein, I guess is the big one everyone knows. Um, just make sure you're substituting it with something, you know, so do your research. And I feel like I'm not the best example because I like very plain average tasting food. So for me, like just the to tofu out of the carton, like I could do that. And it doesn't really bother me that it's kind of bland and tasteless because food's not like a top priority for me anyways. So as long as it's giving me what the nourishment I need so I can get back to drawing, <laughs> I mean, that's really what I see food as. This is like a means to an end, I guess. But yeah, um, I know a lot of people like Aria. Uh, she has been giving me recipes and she's very excellent on knowing like how to make good tasting vegan food. So maybe even like find a friend or look online for good recipes. That would be my suggestion. To do, um, you're welcome, Lady Coyote. Uh, Luva says, what if each key unlocks the memories and wisdom of the person that owned that arm and the original key not only defeats the entity but also unlocks some kind of cosmos, cosmic wisdom that is holding and by doing that you obtain the ultimate cosmic knowledge and become some kind of new divine identity, like a ladder of arms to ultimate knowledge. Hmm... I do like that idea of, like, does this creature have a key for itself? That is definitely something I want to explore constantly while we're doing this together. So what do you guys think of that? Like, what if, do we put the creature's key also in the key ring? I guess that's something that we should take note of. Yeah, but thank you for that suggestion, Luva. 
Jim says, when it comes to prints, do you make prints of the pieces you sell as originals? If so, do you not sell prints after the original sells? Um, nope, I still sell prints of the originals after the original sell. There will be people out there that specifically look for originals. They will be deemed the collectors <laughs> as we're working on a piece called The Collector. Uh, they do not care if you sell prints of it most often because they have the original. So to them, it's like, I have the original that you're just buying a copy of. So it's almost like a, um, if you can imagine like a trading, or no, that's not a good example. Like, <laughs> being able to say that you own the first and only copy of something is like a, something to brag about, I guess. So the all the collectors that I've talked about, they do not care if you sell prints of the original. Um, at least that's just my experience. Um, Femme says, it kind of reminds me of the idea that brunettes always want to be blondes and blondes want to be brunettes now. What are you talking about? <laughs> I think I missed something here. You might have to fill me in on that one. Um, Adrian says, I like tofu with soy sauce, especially fried tofu. You know, I don't do that. I did that once, though, recently, actually, and it was so good. Yeah, if I just take, like, a little extra time, I find that I actually really like cooking food. So I think as I'm getting more settled into like a lifestyle, and I'm not just working like 100% of the time, I'm trying to spend more time living and interacting with the world that maybe I wasn't before, and cooking and trying to genuinely, genuinely enjoy that process has been one of those. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Or maybe cooking tofu in more ways than just eating it right out of the carton. Okay. So I'll probably have more arms and hands coming up here. Oops, can you see it? There we go, here. So instead of rendering down here too much, I'm gonna go ahead and render in there. So I'm gonna actually move the camera in a bit more so you guys can see it. Let me manually focus this. I have the camera set right now to a set focus. If I can edit it. There we go. So I'm going to really focus on the four here. So I will switch to my mechanical pencil, but then I'll probably punch out the last in a 9B. Uh, you know what, as I say that, I'm going to wait until the whole drawing is finished, and then I'll probably go back and 9B certain areas of it. That way I can feel more comfortable um, not smudging it throughout. Now I'm getting kind of cold being in the basement. <laughs> um, oh, Fem says it was your piece with the two boys with everything contrasted. I gotcha. Um, Arya says, this is beginning to remind me a bit of Kingdom Hearts if it had a horror vibe. Yeah, right. Oh, that's right. I got to draw keyholes on these guys. And the nice thing about the mono eraser is I can feel comfortable getting these like very small areas without erasing the areas that I want to stay. I'm gonna quickly change the settings on my phone so that it stays open. What is it, the auto lock here? Oh, you know what? Hold on. Let me get a charger really quick for my phone because it's about to die any second now and I need it for my drawing.
Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't realize my phone was at literally 1%. <laughs> um, I really like the idea of the ring holder to be the key of the entity. Yeah, I like that idea too. Oops. There we go. So I'm gonna turn off my low power mode so my phone will just stay open. So basically if any of you wanna do it, you just go to the, what is it, auto lock? Yeah, change it to never. There we go, so now it'll just stay open. And I gotta make sure I draw these keyholes too. Okay. Whew, am I really out of breath just from running upstairs? Hold on, <laughs> let me take a moment here. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I agree with you on, like originals, there's real charm to seeing the graphite smudges or the hairs of the brush left behind, agreed. Um, Jim says, how do I balance life outside of art and cons? Well, that is a great question considering um, a lot of stuff with like relationships is new to me. Well, thank you. Oh my God, it's an owl for following. So um, currently I'm, I just started being in a relationship. I think it was like three or four months ago. It was in May. And it was one of those where I told them it was going to be really tough the next few months because I have so many cons and it's a conversation that you just have with them and you make sure that they understand that you're going to be gone a lot and like part of your life will always be dedicated to this if this is what you choose for yourself so for me I definitely see conventions being something for me in kind of a long-term investment so it's not just like for this year only so for me I have I definitely want to be upfront and honest about it so the best part is um, if you can find someone that will be able to do something while you're able to do the same thing or uh, something that you love as well. So for instance, they love playing video games. I love drawing. So they can just sit on a couch and play video games while I can draw and essentially watch because I feel like I was a big video gamer back in the day but I don't really play games anymore because I draw all the time. So in that way, it's like I found balance in being able to kind of get both. Um, but when it comes to like my family and friends then, so it's like first relationship and then with family, uh, I definitely try to make time for my mom and dad specifically just because they've been such a good influence in my life pretty much my whole life that I want to make sure that I give back to them, especially since I don't know how much time I'm going to have with them, you know? Something we all hate to think about, but something that is an honest realization and fear that, yeah, our parents will most likely die before us. And I want to make sure that I got to know them and ask them the questions that I want to know before they're gone. So I take more time, at least like once a week, to get lunch with them or something. And I think that's been helping kind of calm that fear. <laughs> um, and then for those of you who know me, probably know that I'm really close to my friends. Like friends to me are my hand chills and family in a lot of ways. So I'd like to give them a lot of time and attention too. Thankfully, while we're at cons, we get to hang out nonstop. But then outside of it, it's kind of a awful truth. But if you're not an artist, it's very hard for me to spend um, time with people that don't do art for a living. And I think some of my friends have been okay with it, like especially like my high school friends. I think they kind of understand that I don't have a lot of time to myself to draw anymore. So doing something like going out to a bar or something is just something I will never be interested in necessarily and I just won't make the time for that and 
while, yeah, you'll probably lose some friends, and I guess this is a good truth for a lot of you to know, uh, you'll find new friends that do enjoy doing the same thing. So it's not like it has to end on a bad note. I've had a lot of high school friends that, yeah, we don't really speak much on like the weekly or even the monthly for a lot of them, but when I see them at like random weddings or whatever reunions, it's like a great little reunion. And if they are really good friends, it'll be like yesterday. You don't have to worry about losing necessarily a friendship because you, you're really focused on what you're passionate about. Not sure how I want these keyholes to look. I don't know if this looks like too cartoony. Let me, hold on, let me Google keyhole. This is a really weird thing to just type into Google. Yeah, I guess I kind of want them to all look like this. Maybe not so. Do I make every keyhole different? Ooh, that's a tough one. Hmm. Or do I make some look like deep cut? I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Let me know. You know, do I make the keyholes more look? Oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like that at all. Never mind. Answered my own question. <laughs> is that funny when that happens where you're like oh I, maybe this will look better and then as soon as you do it you're like nope definitely not better hate it actually <laughs> go back There we go. I'm going to leave a lot of this in blank. Because I might want to render it a little differently. Um, Hemlock says, man, I feel what you are saying. I don't have any art friends around me, so my social life just doesn't exist. Oh, um... Oh, Hemlock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, how you doing? You're it's People that don't know, unless if you have a different username and this just happens to be a coincidence, but I'm pretty sure it's you. Uh, this is someone I met in Colorado Springs, and they are doing really, really well for their age, and they'll definitely be definitely a player in the art world sometime soon. It says, I'm glad I got to be a part of the stream, but I got to go, so I hope I'll catch another one next week. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Every Wednesday at 2 p.m. I'll be here. Unless I'm at a con, randomly, like I was the last two weeks. But usually I'm really good about not missing them. Um, hey, Cass. By the way, we got your letters in the mail. Thank you so much for doing that. It says, I know for me, dating who I am dating right now is easy because he's just as passionate about cooking as I am with art. So we both understand the pros and cons and how little we will get to be able to see each other. See? If you can have someone that will understand and respect that, then I think that's a good choice. Otherwise, if they do not understand, then I don't know if that is the right person to be with. Um, it's like no fault of their own, but if you are passionate about art, you almost need to find someone that can respect it and allow you the time necessary to um, do your craft. Because for us, it takes a lot of time, especially drawing, you know? And if person you're with doesn't allow you that time it's really hard to to be with them and not think about oh I could be drawing right now or 
man, if only I could have like three hours of just dedicated work without making my partner feel less than or like that they're not important, you know. So you got to find that. And don't rush it. I feel like I got so much done being single for most of my life. that I'm kind of glad I didn't get into a relationship until I was late 20s. <laughs> I mean, that could just be for me, but I feel like it really helped me just focus because I didn't have any type of distraction, really. Um, to do. Oh, where? Uh, Girl Sean says, might be interesting to have a dark aura to the to up the contrast around an all-white keyhole. I think I have to. Let me try that. Like, every hand might... Like, I don't want to make it too obvious that that's what I'm doing, like, just playing with the contrast around it, but I almost agree with you where it almost has to. Otherwise, I feel like I'm densely rendering it, which is definitely something I don't want to do. And I guess I really should do more tests of the keyhole before I'm, like, going hard in rendering these. I don't know, do you, do you guys like how that looks? For some reason, I'm like on the fence about it. Um, Fem says, maybe it's more of a scar in that shaping. Once you pick a key and hold it closed, it opens the wound again. Ooh. I mean, that's super creepy and awesome. I don't know if it would read if I did like literally 200 keyholes to make them look like scabs. I'd... I have a feeling it wouldn't read it the way that I want it to. But even right now, I feel like these aren't... Maybe because I'm, like, forcing them to read toward the camera. And maybe if I like purposely don't draw them like perfectly facing the camera so you can see within them, that might help me. And also I think I'm making them too dark. So let me, let me focus on that. Um, Cal Kitty says, I like how the keyhole looks right now. It renders some kind of magical this way. Okay. So then are we kind of digging it? Because then maybe I'll leave it. Maybe this is one of those times where I'm, like, being overly critical of myself. Yeah, let me focus on this arm right now. Um, yeah, of course, Cass. Thank you for this last second housing. Oh, my gosh, are you kidding? You're more than welcome to come to any art jam we have. It was a pleasure. Because I think that's something that uh, I just want to make known, even with like the art jams that I throw, or if I meet you at a convention. I like I love hanging out with artists, and I like having. Um, it's like the more the merrier. I really believe in that with the the art world. So like with the art jams, like I am not going to tell someone they can't come because they don't have a you know, a certain following on Instagram or something gross like that. Like to me it's like the more the merrier. And I always tell people younger artists inspire me more than older artists. And the reason I'm sure those that come to my stream lots already know this, but the reason is because younger artists haven't found their voice yet. So they're still open to experimentation and try new things and try things that the masters would not because they kind of found their safe comfort bubble 
and they just kind of repurpose art that they've already done because they've established their style and they can make money off of it now. The younger artists, they don't have that security. So they're like playing and messing around and they're, in my opinion, more in tune with culture. So they're able to then be influenced by the natural state of things and have that influence their work as well. So I look to the masters maybe for like a technical rendering ability, but when it comes to creativity, I look to younger artists. So for me to not see the potential of younger artists because of how much of a following they have on social media is ridiculous. And I think younger artists have actually more potential a lot of the times than these older ones. So yeah, like having someone like you at the art jam is great because then you have a great style already and it's just going to get better and better and better. And for me, that's like inspiring. It like refuels my fire because I was the same exact person. So it's like I get to see myself in younger artists and then it, anytime I'm feeling slow or if I'm feeling lazy, like that's just like a surge of electricity that sometimes I need. And it's like, oh, that's right. Like, what are you doing, Tim? Like, get your butt back to drawing. Like, you're better than this. <laughs> uh, you don't get to just sleep in just because of um, where you're at right now. And I hate that. I hate when artists seem to just settle because they've established themselves in some usually very small way. And I never want to be that artist. I think that's why I'm doing a piece like this. Not only to show people that, you know, I'm I'm still pushing myself, I'm still trying new things, but even for myself, it's like, don't get comfortable. I could just draw, you know, people with demon horns all day and make a living off of that, but that wouldn't feel justified or feel like I wouldn't be into it, honestly. If I'm not into what I'm drawing, why am I even drawing it in the first place? And if the money is ever financial based, then I don't know if I would consider myself an artist. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sean said, Girl Sean says, I like the idea of subtly adding contrast. They look good so far. Keep experimenting until you like it. Thank you. Right? I just slowly build up those values. Uh, Noah Wizard says, have you tried a deeper cut? Isn't a hand like an inch deep in that area for all the bones and tendons? Yes. I know that's why I'm like, do I even have a shadow on it? Because I think I would like it to look like the hand goes all the way through. But then I'm like, well, are these keyholes portals? So when the key goes through, it's not like going through the hand itself. It's going into like this portal that it unlocks. I don't know. What do you guys think? Because we could make it look like it is an inch deep, but then we'd have to re-render it a little bit, which I'm totally cool with, by the way. Um, CC says, I've only graduated high school for now, and therefore I'm fairly young, but I am really glad to have skipped on the so-called high school dating experience. Agreed. It's interesting because you want a relationship so bad, but then when you're in it, yeah, there's definitely benefits and whatnot, but... It's then like managing how do I fit this into my life with what I already had pre-existing to it. And those that can make it work are the ones that definitely found balance. And yeah, it's, it's difficult. I'm not going to pretend it's not. But um, even with me figuring out, okay, how do we, how do we make this work? And just being very open and, and talk about it. That's probably actually the best advice I can give anyone, any artist especially someone that's dating someone who's not an artist is just to have open communication. It's more that you can kind of communicate that. Yeah. I want to make sure that I have time to be with you, but also time where I can just be drawing because honestly that seems to be more limited the older we get. And especially this time before there's any type of like uh, kids or anything like that, because then your time becomes really, uh, what's what's a good way to put it? Precious. You're you're very aware of how much time you have to do certain things. That's something that I I want to be hyper aware of while I'm in this like new relationship already.
Oh, I kind of like this where the keyhole doesn't seem to have that like little sliver of depth, but it almost looks like. Oh, you know what? I think this is how I'm going to render all the keyholes. So it's not like a exact harsh line. I'm going to try to give some wrinkles, though, to this. Um, Cass says, someone earlier mentioned having a non-existent social life, and I'm mostly the same way, lol. It does, it was really nice and refreshing to be around so many artists, especially ones that are so kind-hearted. Well, thank you, Cass. You were, you were such a pleasure to be around. I hope you can come to future ones, too. But I think that is something that, um, I'm learning even with the con life. Find friends that are artists. It, it becomes so much easier to not only relate, but then to talk about uh, when you're down or if you're having a frustrating time. When you have artists that are friends, they can relate to you. You know, it's something that is not foreign to them either. So they'll be able to probably give some good advice on how to move past it. Yeah, like this keyhole could use some help here. <laughs> we'll just redo that one here. Uh, Fem says, I don't know what I was expecting, but I googled keyhole hand. Oh boy, I'm nervous to look. Oh! A, a little big, but yes. <laughs> of course, yes. Okay, so let me see if I can render this one a bit better, too. Get more of those tendons going in here. So here's a good example where it's, it's far too dark. It almost looks like a mistake. And for this hand, I'm gonna actually use my other reference photo to kind of help me fill in the missing puzzle pieces of where things should go. Um, Sean, girl Sean says, is that a black wing? It is not, but I do have a black wing pencil somewhere in here. And I do like those as well. For those of you who don't know, that is a brand of pencil. Ta-da! Um, my pearls that are super smooth, and I love them. For some reason, though, I, when I work with them, I like to almost w like working entirely with just that pencil. For some reason, I don't mix them with like other pencils. I'm not even sure why, to be honest. I probably should more often. All right, let's try to fix this key here.
It is like butter. You are correct. So if any of you guys want to try out a new pencil brand, that is a great one. Actually, my friend Elaine Ryan, who is Pete Moorbacher's uh, con manager, first introduced me, and I love them. Like I said, for some reason, I don't like mixing them with other pencils, even though they work great, so I don't know what my deal is. Hmm. You can hear our little puppy upstairs. That's Tyler's dog, Luna. See, like this keyhole might get a little lost, but I'm almost okay with that. I want every key not to feel perfectly angled toward the camera. I just have to deal, like the part in me that wants it to be like perfectly seen has to just like let go of that control a little bit. This finger is just under this one. Oh, I got a little bit of a tangent. I might have to be just okay with that though. Okay. So you can see how we rendered out these hands. Let me do maybe like two more for the stream. So I'm actually working a little quicker than I expected something I don't normally say it too often. <laughs> but what's great, and even as I look at them, like, oh, I might have to do some value adjustments later on, it's okay. As long as I'm kind of creating a base for myself to work from. Take that photo. See, get a little good reference shot. Easy to draw with. Um, CC says, as I'm listening to the stream and I'm working on a film study of Whiplash, I was wondering what you think of it in case you watched it. Um, in case you don't know, I feel like I'm also a secret film critic reviewer uh, I try to watch a new movie every single day and I love film I like it would have been my other career I think if I wasn't a um, artist I love 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 movies so in terms of um, what I thought of Whiplash I thought it was excellent I like the director I thought he did a great job with conveying a message of what is the best way to teach and to learn and even though his is more of an extreme method does it get results and it's one that is definitely brings up conversation and one that I really like having a conversation and dialogue with because of how different the interpretations can be and actually I showed it to Sean Price Art of Price online and it became his favorite movie and I think because a lot of us especially creative people can relate to it. We understand how sometimes the most critical people in our life can also be the most helpful and they push us to learn. And even when it seems kind of demeaning, it's inspiring us and motivating us to almost prove them wrong. So I had, um, oh, it was actually, my boy taught me this about how 
Everyone in your life is a positive influence. And what does that mean? It's a Buddhist statement where even the people that treat us badly actually have a positive effect on us because they either um, help us grow and learn what not to do or they push us to be better almost to prove them wrong. So there's this idea that we need both the people that are super encouraging and helpful in, you know, acknowledging our um, our work and our, not, I mean, kind of our existence. But also you need those people that will kind of hate on it and that will just talk bad about you. And I feel like having both has actually helped me in a lot of ways because I've had so many people especially when I was in college, call my stuff um, too feminine. Um, everything looked like Justin Bieber. I would have people kind of knock me for it being too soft or that, uh, especially then when I started to get primarily with pencil, that uh, graphite doesn't sell. It's a lesser medium. And I would just always deal with this very negative reaction to my work, but it just motivated me. And I think a lot of you can relate to that too, where the things that are meant to put us down can actually fuel a fire that's growing inside of us. So I love whiplash because of kind of that reason, but also my teacher in high school was incredibly cruel to me. And to this day, I still consider her the best teacher I've ever had. And was she being mean intentionally? I don't think so, but was it coming across really harsh and kind of borderline insulting? Not even borderline, a lot of it. Like one time she emailed my parents and said that I wasn't a real artist and I was just a photocopy machine. And up until that point, I was just recreating portraits and I was drawing like celebrities and I wasn't really doing any original stuff. And after that point, I kind of was, I was so angry, I drew did a painting of someone screaming and it was really dark and purple and not what I was normally doing. And then I showed it to her expecting a response of like an apology or something. Of like, I'm sorry I made you feel this way. But instead she was like, now we're getting somewhere with you. And I think it was at that moment it clicked in my head. She wanted that reaction. She wanted me to get angry and put some kind of actual life within my drawing. Because up until then... It was very drab and recycled. And yeah, maybe at the time it hurts, but I'm so, th so, 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 so thankful I had someone like her in my life who constantly reminded me that even if you're a big fish at um, high school, also known as what she would say, a very small pond, compared to the rest of the world, as she would say, the ocean, you're a guppy. And I'm, I'm actually really glad I had someone that Maybe may have seemed negative at the time, but looking back in hindsight, I am so thankful I had someone that believed in me enough to push me in a way that may have been seen as not the typical, a very atypical way of learning, and which is very much what Whiplash also um, showcases. Um, that reference picture is staring at me. Oh, it totally is. Oh, that's creepy. I'll put it out of the frame. I'm sorry. Here, I'll move this over. Ugh, I don't want my face in there either. Oh, wait, I got an idea. <laughs> Much better, right? Um, do do uh, Raznov2000 says, love your work. I've been lurking in here for a while now. Hey, thank you. Um, Femsa, oh, that's, yeah, that's right. Uh, Girl Sean says, it was really hard for me to watch, but I thought it was good. I totally agree. Um, Jim says, that is interesting. The theory that one can't make interesting or exciting artwork unless one is basically in a passion, either good or bad. It's definitely a conversation worth having. Like, if I created art that wasn't from a genuine place of inspiration? Am I just repurposing essentially what I've done in the past that I know works? I, it's definitely interesting, especially when you really look into 
your process and how you create art. And that's why I always joke with people that if you go through a heartbreak or if an artist goes through a heartbreak and they, they start writing things, um, whether it be songwriting or whatever their outlet of creativity is, usually it feel it's so much better because it's so honest. It comes from a place of heartbreak, usually heartbreak. And the the work just has a deeper meaning to it because of that. And it's not to necessarily it's better. I guess I shouldn't use the word better. But I in my opinion, it just it feels more raw and in a way it's, it's like allowing the artist to be more vulnerable. And when you're, you do that with an audience, I feel like you're able to connect more. And that's why I always joke that you can Adele the, a situation. And um, as she, she says in her songs, turn her sorrow into solid gold. And I fully believe in that. I believe when you see people, you know, it, get in these terrible situations and then rise above them and they do it creatively, it just speaks volumes. And I still believe that to this day, actually. I'm going to change this just a little bit here. Um, Femme says perfection. <laughs> uh, Cass says, I keep catching myself getting shy and insecure with my art recently, so this is a great stream to listen to. I need to create my own screaming picture. Maybe maybe everyone needs to have like this outlet drawing or painting where they just really get out their anger or their feeling. Um, and usually it's toward a critique or someone else. Sometimes we need that. We need that outlet. And I think for a lot of us, it is art and it is drawing. But too often I think we're pressured into drawing things we don't want to draw. To draw. I've talked to so many artists that do conventions with me and they talk about the the pain about having to do fan art even though they don't want to. Now, I personally, I'm not one way or the other in terms of, like, if someone wants to do fan art, I get it. That's how I started. And there is that slight gray area because it is illegal. So you want to be careful. If that's something you're going to pursue, just be careful that you can, you know, ready the consequence. But in terms of making a profit, I've learned that that is not what you need to do uh, if you want to make money at conventions, pretty much all my friends do all original by choice. And we make more money than the people doing fan art. And that's not to say that that will happen right away. It takes a bit of years to kind of find your own voice and really stand out amongst the crowd. But if you do that, your art can be timeless. And it's not kind of weighted down by what's popular in pop culture and the media. I have a lot of friends that do um, fan art as well that I see at shows, and I talk to them, and they're stressed out. They <laughs> they say it's a struggle keeping up sometimes with what's new and popular because, one, you never know what's going to be the next big thing, and then when it does kind of emerge that it is, everyone's going to jump on it. So then you have to be better than pretty much everyone that's also jumping on that fan, fan art, uh, whatever that new show or video game is and you have to stand out amongst everyone else that's jumping on that boat but if you do art that's kind of uniquely you you're really only competing with yourself and that's kind of the beauty of it but I definitely understand what you mean in terms of that um Skyker12 says I broke my dominant arm on an accident driving my motorcycle I can't draw really long time I'm fighting my madness now. That scares the hell out of me. That honestly is probably my biggest fear is that I'll hurt my arm and I can't draw. I don't know what I would do. I would do what you're doing right now and go crazy. <laughs> Oops, why am I rendering with a 6B? Hold on. <laughs> I was like, why is this so dark? Duh. <laughs> Um, Pompadour Zeus says, were you talking about Synecdoche, New York? That is my favorite movie alongside The Fall and Spirited Away. Those, I think, are my top three, with Moulin Rouge being a, a close second and right under those three tied. 
I just think Synecdoche, New York is a movie that you can watch at different intervals of your life and get a different reaction and emotional response to. And it's all about the passing of time and how, how that affects us and the people around us and a lot, in a lot of ways, I guess, the meaning of life. And it's not, I don't want to say it's heartbreaking, but I will say it's a very honest and heart-wrenching view of the world we live in and how we will most likely leave it. So I think that movie needs to be watched with like full attention. You can't just put that in the background while you're drawing. And there are very different reactions to that. My roommate in college hated it, absolutely hated the movie. Then I saw it and I was crying at the end. I was so affected by it. But if there's a movie I can easily recommend to anyone, regardless of what type of movie you're into, it's called The Fall by Tarsum. But don't watch the trailer. Trailer's horrible. And I think it tries to give away a lot of the plot, which I don't know why trailers do that at all. It just makes me frustrated, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, The Fall is a movie I think every artist should watch. If you haven't seen it yet and you're an artist and you're watching this, watch The Fall. You won't be disappointed. Uh, Mighton says, do you have any examples of drawings where you were vulnerable like that in a positive way instead of depression or heartbreak? Yeah, I think this drawing right now. I feel like I am really putting my energy into like storytelling. And I feel like because I don't have this energy of heartbreak and sadness lingering in my head, I can really focus on making the story the best that it can be. And I, I wondered that, to be honest with you, after I kind of moved on from my first heartbreak of will I be able to do art that feels emotionally charged? Because sadness is a very easy emotion. I mean, I write this in my book. It's a very easy emotion to latch onto and create from. So what happens when you don't have that emotion anymore? And uh, what if you just have happiness? So here's the conclusion I came to. I think when you're sad, your thoughts become very clouded and it becomes pretty much the only thing you can think about. And in a lot of ways, I would consider it distracting. And yeah, you might create art that's emotionally charged and emotional, but a lot of it is directed at one other person. And you almost allowed this other person to have control over your thoughts and your actions. And even though that my last heartbreak kind of charged me to do my first sketchbook and kind of led me down this path of doing a more of a traditional focus. And I'm very thankful that that happened. But I'm actually even more grateful that in that process, I found my own self-respect and I learned to like the person I am and that I'm not only capable of loving this other person, but I'm capable of loving myself. So then when you start to focus your energy on, I want to make myself better. I want to do things that benefit me almost like in a sub slightly like selfish way you're like I want to do things that make me happy if I want to go see this new movie I'm gonna go if I want to go take a walk in the park or go to the aquarium I'm gonna do it and I don't need someone else by my side to do that then all of a sudden you find the strength that you didn't even know you were capable of having and your art in my opinion can just skyrocket because you're no longer creating these very sad melancholy pieces that I think for lack of better words, has been done in many, many different ways before. And I am not, I'm not, you know, an exception to that because I've been there. I've drawn very sad, emotionally charged art. But now that I'm kind of past that, I'm creating art that I feel stands on its own from not being just sadness based, you know, like even with this drawing here, it feels more of like a storyteller kind of weird fantasy piece and I like that. I like diving into this realm that feels unexplored. So I think both are good. I think one isn't necessarily better than the other. But for me personally, doing the art that I'm doing now feels so much more refreshing than doing art that was always sad. And I'm sure a lot of you feel that way too when you're, you draw a lot of sad art. Sometimes you can get known for being the, you know, the artist that draws sad things. And it kind of becomes the truth the more that you do it and you just start to accept that you're like this sad person. 
so I think rather than me just accepting that I'm going to forever be a sad person, I was like, I don't, I don't want to be sad forever. I don't want to be angry forever. I'm going to move on from this because it's affecting my life on a day to day when I, I don't care anymore. I'm letting this person have such an effect over me. So anyways, sorry, I'm tangenting a bit because I'm like trying to focus on rendering these arms too at the same time. But I just want you guys to know that, you know, you don't have to be sad to create emotionally charged pieces. You can also create just as effective in pieces that make you feel good about yourself as an artist in a happy state of mind too. Oh boy, uh, let's see here. Luva says, I feel like being hard on someone and the teaching technique of screaming or being mean is like trusting the belief that suffering builds strength and that's how we, and that can be very toxic. And I also feel like it is the easy way because it is much more easy to be cruel at someone instead of finding ways of creating motivation and interest. There are also good ways of achieving our potential without getting through that. Oh, I agree. Um, I remember how angry my art teacher made me feel in high school. And if I wasn't someone that kind of answered back at her, I mean, yeah, she could have really done some damage to me. And that's why I don't think teachers like the one exhibited in Whiplash or even the one that I had in high school are ne necessarily the best examples of, like, teachers that define what teaching should be. I agree with you because I think they can also be horrible in making people feel bad about themselves. And in a way, then you lost <laughs> what I think you were trying to do in the first place of like motivate that person. So I think you kind of have to figure out personality types. And I think I'm definitely a personality type that I like to be pushed. I like that raw criticism. Do I think it's the right method? I actually don't. I think a lot of the methods ex even exhibited in Whiplash are too extreme and can really hurt people. And I think that suicide example that happened in the movie is very real. I think when, you know, the person that's supposed to believe in you really lets you have it and makes you feel like nothing, yeah, you can, your whole self-worth becomes into question. So I agree with you. That's why when I teach people, I'm definitely not cruel, but I try to be honest. And I think my best, my favorite word is to be firm. So like, you, you encourage them, but you don't let them get comfortable or sloppy because you, you're just proud of everything they do. You want to make sure that you're still pushing them because I've seen a lot of artists that when they get comfortable, they just sit there and they sit there for a while. And I never want any one of the people that I'm teaching or especially any of the people that, uh, that are my friends to fall into that. Because then I feel like I'm not being a good friend if I'm not helping push my friends be the best versions of themselves and the best and create the best versions of their art that they can then what am I just like a yes man like someone that's just like everything you do is amazing because I don't think that's actually helpful um to do yes Raznov 2000 the fall just don't watch the the trailer Adrian says, when is your next sketchbook Kickstarter? It is in March of next year. Thank you for asking. I'm so excited for that one. It's like, this guy will be in there. Pretty much my big drawings will be in my next sketchbook. Because I'm really focusing on quality this time around. Yeah, let me zoom up a little bit. Let me make this a little more crisp for you guys. There we go. Um, Gona Goth says, I often see myself looking for emotional movies or music to get into some sad mood. I know that is not the best option, but I'm like a restless drawing machine when I'm feeling sorrowful. Agreed. 
I think that's why I honestly do that as well. I mean, the roommates will sometimes poke fun at me because I like to watch television that's very sad. Um, I watch uh, My 600 Pound Life, which I don't know if any of you have seen, but sometimes their stories are just gut-wrenching. And to hear, like, how how bullied they were, like, usually the ones that have been watching recently have been focused on how, like, their family didn't even care about them. And they turned to food because of it, and... It just, I don't know if it's because I have this weird empathy with people that are in situations that they can't control. And, I mean, I've seen episodes, though, where they're clearly the ones that are harming themselves and not because of emotional distress. It's because they are just very selfish. Um, There's only, like, two or three episodes where I watch where I'm like, ooh, like... I just don't feel like you're a good person. (laughs) But then most of them, I'm just like, some of them I'm crying at. I I know it sounds so bizarre, um, but there was one, and this was actually an episode of Catfish, but he was a heavyset male, and he was saying about the reason he catfishes is because he doesn't like who he is, and he hates the size that he's at. And he was talking about how... um, I'm going to try to say this without getting emotional because sometimes I'm a sap, honestly. Um, He was saying how he was trying to figure out a way to kill himself, but he was so ashamed and embarrassed that someone would have to find his body and would have to move it that he couldn't go through with it. And it was, I don't know, sometimes it when someone's that honest, and I know it's reality television, but that did not feel scripted. And there are moments like that that just feel so hurtful and raw. And I think sometimes I I need that in my life as a reminder that there are a lot of people going through a lot of pain. And even though I feel like I've hit this point of being really happy with where I'm at in my life, that I still need to recognize that there's other people around me living that still could use some kindness. And we have no shortage of that. But unfortunately, I feel like nowadays a lot of people are very selfish and we treat our kindness to others as if it's in a limited supply. And I think that's why I still watch things that are emotionally charged like that because then it's a good reminder to, you know, still treat other people even with, like, common decency, you know? Because then, you know, you watch some of these episodes and the cameras follow them, obviously, and you get you see them harassed all the time. And it makes me really sad because then you just see them, like, start crying in their car. I don't know. Maybe, there's, maybe this is just a thing that really affects me, but when someone is really that honest about feeling like a misfit in the world feeling like they don't belong and that no one actually cares about them. I I feel that because I felt that way when I was younger. And I think a lot of us do. And that's why we turn to drawing because we want to connect and relate to other people. And this is our medium in which we can speak more clearly. And that's why you see a lot of sad art, (laughs) you know. There we go. Sorry about that weird tangent. Um, Wisp Light said, I have, I have to skedaddle. I like that. And I really get to catch these, but I had a wonderful time listening and watching while I worked on my own stuff. You're very inspiring. Have a good day, all. Hey, well, thanks for stopping by. Carol Sean says, I like honest raw critique, but delivered in a way that's without a doubt intending to be constructive. That is a great way to word it. I like honest raw critique, but delivered in a way that's without a doubt intending to be constructive. I'm going to actually save that. That's so good. Um, Adrian says, sometimes I like watching emotional shows or movies in order to experience those intense emotions. Exactly. Perspective is good. Also true. Uh, Raznov2000 says, what show is it is that I would love to see it? It's called My 600 Pound Life. Now I warn you, there are a few episodes where you genuinely get like frustrated with the person that's going through this whole weight loss surgery. 
and that only happened like two or three times where you're like, mm, like you're making it so tough on your family and you're being very selfish. But most of them are just sad and you feel their pain. And I guess one more example, then I'll stop with this tangent. Uh, there was one episode where, oops, where the girl received a, a package um, and it was like this random friend online thing and she received in the mail uh, candles and she was talking about how she never receives gifts because she doesn't feel she's worth giving anything to and <laughs> I feel like I'm going to start crying even talking about it and you just feel for someone that honestly feels like they're not worth receiving a candle <laughs> And it just, it breaks my heart because I, I feel for that person. And I don't know if it's just because I grew up, you know, very much under my parents who taught me to, you know, care for every single person, even the people that you don't necessarily agree with or like. You know, it's like always still treat them with kindness and don't be a bully. Don't add to their hurt, their pain, and try to, if you can, help in some way so I think I, yeah, I don't know if I'm just attracted to these type of shows because then they are like good reminders for myself um, not that I'm like bullying people on the streets um, I, I try to be very you know genuinely nice to everyone I meet but I think it's just a reminder you know, of, you know people are feeling pain even if I'm in like my blissful happy state that I feel I am in now to, you know, to remember that there's people that are hurting and that even just, honestly, just saying hi and, like, I like your shoes or something. I remember I, I there was this older woman that just looked kind of sad and she was sitting on a bench, but she had some, like, cool colored shoes that were, like, red and yellow. And I was like, that well, one, I'm like, that's unusual for um, someone to just be out and about in because they were just funky shoes. So I went up to her and I was like, hey, I just want to let you know that you have some really cool shoes and I hope you have a good day. And then her whole sadness just seemed to like melt off her. And it's funny how you can affect someone by doing so little. Um, the other thing was, now I'm getting like all stupid sappy, was uh, someone did this experiment that I just watched a video of where they would um, tell people that they don't really know, but, you know, they're kind of friends with, acquaintances with, and they would just tell them that they wanted to take a picture of something they find beautiful. And they took reactions of when they said, find beautiful. And you could just tell people would get emotional or they felt something from that. And it kind of goes back to my whole thought of, you can do so much by doing so little. And I think even using this, you know, art world as a platform, I, I don't want to use it anymore for what I used to, which was like an outlet for my feelings and when I was really sad and I wanted someone to relate to. Now I see it as a way to help others and to kind of let people know that you're not alone. You know, there are people that do care about you, but you're just surrounded, unfortunately, with ones that don't. And... It's that whole idea of like, you know, things get better, but it needs to be more than that. And I, I want to start, you know, showing people that you need to act upon, you know, being nice to others, not just saying it. Anyways. Okay. Um, Adrian says, I appreciate your tangents in today's streams. There's a lot of heartfelt insight. Well... I hope that helped in some way. I know sometimes I can ramble. Um, Skyker12 says, Since you like emotional things, how about District 9? That ending always breaks me in tears. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, my favorite sad movies? Oof. I found Moon utterly sad. I know that's supposed to be like a sci-fi psychological thriller slash drama. But I just thought it was sad. I thought it was really sad. Uh, a single man I found pretty sad. Actually, no, I didn't find that sad. I'm sorry. 
That was more uplifting. Thank you, Hakiro MS, for following. Synecdoche, New York is an unbelievably sad. Um, the movie that I cried the most at, though, is the documentary called Earthlings. And it's not so much a movie as it is, like, animal cruelty for an hour and a half and learning how cruel humans can be to animals. And that, for like an hour straight, I cried. And it was kind of like an ugly cry. The ones that you don't really see in movies. Uh, I think if any of you have seen it, it's the moment, well, there's a lot of moments, but the one that really like makes me ugly cry is when they take a full-grown pig and they grab it by the hooves and they flip it over this guy's shoulder and then smacks it back on the cement ground. And uh, you hear it squeal. Oof. Like, even talking about it gets to me. And just to think that, like, someone could be that cruel and that apathetic to the pain that this animal, this other being of life, is feeling. I, <laughs> I mean, that movie is partially the final decision of why I went vegan, but it, it almost made me disgusted by humans, and I try to believe that everyone has good within them that no one's inherently bad or evil. It's very Kingdom Hearts for me to say that, but I actually do believe that. And I feel like culture and other factors influence in, into choosing more of that um, nasty, violent, cruel lifestyle. Because you never see, well, I guess sometimes with kids, you see them cruel to one another, and it's almost like the they're playing out like this weird power struggle. But a lot of it, like it's that whole idea of that the reason bullies bully is because they've been bullied, either, usually at home, and they're taking out it out on the other kids in their class, which is unfortunate. But you want to stop not so much the kid from bullying the kid at school, but you want to stop the source of it, which is usually the parents not giving enough attention to their child. Sorry that I'm getting, I don't know why I'm so emotional today. I think sometimes talking about this stuff, it just, it gets to me. Um, Fem says, I remember this story about a person who went on a walk to the water intending to kill herself. On the way there, this guy walked by and just smiled and said, good evening, and that just flipped a switch and she went on with her life, even though small things are so important. They really are. I I really think more people should practice doing it more often. Um, Raznov2000 says, I have an example. It was my birthday this week, and I was alone because of all my friends are in the army and my parents are out of the country. And I was all alone in my birthday. Oh, that's so sad. So I decided to go to the gym, and this one random woman just talked to me, and I told her it's my birthday, and she asked me if I want her to buy me something to eat after the gym, and I don't think it was a big deal for her because it's very cheap, and it made me feel so happy, and it meant so much to me. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I need. I want to make it more of a thing in my work, and like I want to start making pins that are more of like reaffirming what we're talking about today, and just like getting people to try their best to be nice to other people. It's not that hard. It's actually not hard at all to be kind to other people, and it goes a long way. Uh, Luva says, in my career, a lot of teachers didn't look well at my illustrations because they said I wasn't expressing myself and only wanted to make fantasy and tell stories. And I couldn't help thinking that connecting with people with stories is the most expressive and beautiful way of sharing feelings and helping others, um, people to see that they are not alone. Yeah. I think we create stories as a way to connect with the people around us. And just because they're fantasy or they're not necessarily people doesn't mean that they're not dealing with relatable things and, I think that's very silly of your teacher not to recognize that. Um, Cass says, it's nice being able to talk to you like this. <laughs> yeah, this is really like, I don't know why I'm like all caught up today. I was, I'm in like a great mood too. Like Dragon Con was amazing. Maybe it's because it's that, you know, reflecting on, even though if your life is going well, you still want to make sure that you're aware of other people and, you know, bringing your positive energy and then sharing it with others. Um, girl Sean says, gosh, really pulling at my pregnant heartstrings. <laughs> I don't mean to be doing that. I'm sorry. 
Uh, Hikaru says, I'm watching from inside a car in Idaho. I couldn't watch during school. Ugh. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you were able to catch it, though. Um, Raznov2000 says, LOL, I'm crying right now. This is an important talk right here, guys. Always be nice to people. Now, now I'm getting all worked up. Guys, this was not supposed to be <laughs> what this stream was about. We're supposed to, like, draw this, like, creature with all these arms and it be this kind of fun discussion today. Um, well, I'm glad that we had this in a way because, you know, it, it's a reminder of why I do art. It's supposed to connect with people and maybe it's not always like this visual. Sometimes it is vocal. Whew. Well, thank you guys for listening to me too. Hugs for everyone. Yeah, I give everyone a hug. So the creature unlocks all of our feelings. We all get a fridge for today. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna cut the stream actually a little early because I gotta go drop my assistant off at the airport. So if there are any final comments or questions, put them in the comments now. So it looks like we have like five more minutes and then I'll go ahead and finish off. Hi, Pui. Oh, Pui is here. So you wanna say hi? Where do I say hello to? Right here, so you are there. Wait. There. Wait. It's looking okay, at this one, there. and then that's the future one. That's the present one. Oh, okay. <laughs> For those of you who don't follow Pui, I'll put his okay, name in the is. description. Okay. How's everyone doing? We got emotional on the stream today. Oh. We were just talking about how it doesn't take much to treat others with kindness and it, how oh. far it goes. I don't know. Okay. Apparently, we've had some people cry. I've gotten a little worked up. Right. It just got... <laughs> total tangent but hey look how many people know you Hello. <laughs> for those of you who don't know Pui's work it's amazing Pui's been my con brother for the past five years we started doing them together mm -hmm. and we've been like learning and growing and actually Pui hit the landmark that I just hit or no wait when did you first hit the... last year so I am finally but slowly catching up to Pui yeah. you still you have a year to catch up I do have a year to catch up. Yeah, because uh, um, last year you, what was it last year or the previous year that you took a little shorter break and I just did more cons. Yeah. So therefore I actually had gained a little bit more experience with cons. So then, yeah. Pui has done really well with conventions and I feel like, um, I feel we like. Both, both prove that convention is large enough that gives us different prospects. Yeah. Into an experience level, be it uh, either financial or as well as uh pleasurable gains yeah and like connecting with other artists and building kind of this so. community in a way yeah. Yeah, yeah and now we are creating a couple of different highs uh one in colorado right the colorado covent and <laughs> a, yeah, yeah, yeah so it's short for coco um so it's a shout out for, to, for the uh, mm -hmm. you guys there and then there's one uh <laughs> florida too right? yeah, yeah we're creating a bunch of different little worlds You'll be surprised, like, if you go out and just talk to the, you know, other artists at conventions that not only will you have a lot in common, but then you can, like, start connecting. Like, we did a lot of Google Hangouts with the people we first started connecting with. Mm -hmm. And now I'll, I'll, some of them live with me at Bonhouse, but then a lot of them we just connect with on, like, um, Skype or Google Hangout calls yeah, to this yeah. day. We so we started meeting in the, um, what was it, the Schomburg Renaissance Hotel. Remember that thing? The what? Yeah, way back way back like six or six years ago maybe what are you talking so about so we were hanging out in a hotel room the lobby area in schomburg you and i yeah oh that's right group of, yeah yeah oh weird 